Welcome to The Bid, where we break down what's happening in the markets and explore the forces changing investing. I'm your host, Mary Catherine Later. Today, we're continuing our mini-series on the long-term forces shaping our future. On our last episode, we talked about genomics and immunology, and today we'll talk about climate change and resource scarcity. After yet another year of record temperatures and extreme weather events, there's more and more discussion about how we can fight climate change and get to a net zero future. That's a future where we don't put any more emissions into the atmosphere than we take out of it. So how exactly can we transition to that lower carbon economy, whether through public policy, new technology, or perhaps different investment practices? What does that transition mean for investing? And what does it mean for the companies and management teams who have to change their behavior to make the transition take place? Today, we speak to Salim Ramji, Global Head of iShares and Index Investments for BlackRock, and Chris Aylman, Chief Investment Officer of CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System. We'll talk about why the low-carbon transition presents a potential investment opportunity, how companies will need to pivot their business models, and the actions BlackRock and CalSTRS are each taking as this transition accelerates. Salim, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thanks, Mary Catherine. It's nice to be here, too. So, Chris, I'll start with you. You're the Chief Investment Officer at CalSTRS, or the California State Teachers Retirement System, the second largest public pension in the U.S., and you're responsible for helping teachers in California enjoy and plan for a secure retirement. So for those who aren't familiar with low-carbon transition investing, can you just explain how sustainability and the transition to a low-carbon economy have become a focus for CalSTRS and what kinds of actions you've taken as a result? We cover a million teachers throughout the state, as you said. You know, when you think about teachers, they're all about teaching children and preparing for the future. So it's been a huge emphasis for us from our membership and from our board is thinking forward not just looking at today, but what's the world going to be like in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. So of ESNG, one issue that's absolutely right at the front of that and changing is the E, the environmental issue. Recognizing that in the next five years and 10 years, things have to change in order to make a difference on climate change. I mean, the world right now is aiming in the Paris Accord to a one and a half degree Celsius, maybe at most two And that means a massive transition away from a carbon-based energy economy transportation system. And that is going to be an enormous transition for companies and for nations. And we want to reposition that portfolio. So it's actually integrated into every single investment we do. We're thinking about that future and whether that company or that investment relies on carbon as a way to generate energy or as a tool or whether they're flexible and can adapt and change going forward. And of course, bridging that kind of climate transition to actual investment decisions has so many questions embedded in it. And two years ago, our chairman and CEO, Larry Fink, shared that we view climate risk as an investment risk and think that there's still a lot of work to be done to really integrate it in portfolios. This year, we heightened our emphasis on net zero in particular. So, Salim, can you just share what we mean by that and where you see opportunities and risks for investors in the low-carbon transition? This isn't only about our clients' values, which are considerable as it hits on issues like climate, just as Chris said, but it's also about value and long-term opportunity. And you can see the long-term opportunity just if you look even just in the last year Last year, there was $210 billion of assessed damages related to climate, 22 events in the United States alone that were a billion dollars or more. That when you look at just the inherent physical risk in the debt markets, by some estimate, there's about $8.7 trillion of debt, or 11% of all rated debt, which has climate risks inherent in it. And I think one of our insights, whether it's in the debt markets, whether it's in finance markets, when you look at utilities or really all facets of the economy, is that a lot of these risks aren't fully priced in. That dislocation is where we think that there's opportunity, either opportunity to avoid risks by being able to price them in or opportunities to really look ahead and be able to see things in new areas like clean energy as being an example. You know, Salim, I want to jump in on that because it does represent a risk. You know a transition is going to happen, but you don't know the timing. 
And that's where the opportunity comes in because the market will price things in, but it is often very short-sighted and it doesn't price things in until six months before they occur. And this is a massive transition. So I agree that it is not just a risk, but it's an opportunity. And it's going to be a heck of a challenge for active investors to figure out how to time that transition and the severity of the transition. Yeah. And I think it becomes an opportunity in particular for long-term investors. Well, predicting the future at all is, of course, challenging and much less that for many more decades as an investor out to 2050. So, Chris, from your perspective as an investor and then Salim in terms of our products, it'd be great to hear how exactly we are trying to make those projections. How are we trying to at least project probabilities for the transition risk? So, for example, data and analytics or rather how to avoid the overly simplistic action of just divesting, for example. Yeah, and I think you hit it on the head. Right now, most people approach this from a very binary up and down reaction of divestment or not. Divestment is not a responsible investment. It is not going to bring about change because the reality is if you sell a company, that company may adjust and adapt and become something different. It's all about being an investment decision. And it is going to be incredibly difficult because you're talking about not just trying to reach out into the future, but climatology and how governments react to that, because this is a global problem. So for us, we think it's about engaging companies, owning them and engaging them to talk about how to transition, talking to CEOs and corporate boards about adapting and being different, not sitting and looking at the past, but looking into the future. You know, they pay a lot of attention to how they dispose of their waste, their water waste, their physical waste, and now they need to pay attention to how they dispose of gaseous waste. And where are their resources? Where do they get their energy? This is not just a transportation problem or an electrical energy. It's an industrial problem, an agricultural problem. It's going to affect every facet of our life. And that transition of who can adapt to that future is going to be huge. And I think you're going to see that coming out of data from companies. That's why we're so passionate about pushing for better reporting with SASB, TCFD. We need corporations to tell us what they're doing and what they're thinking about so we can then make investor decisions about the risk of that company. And we're, of course, getting more and more data from companies. So last year alone, the number of companies reporting SASB disclosures increased three and a half X. So it's helpful as we have a better sense of what companies are doing. But as their behaviors change and their readiness for the transition changes, Celine, what are we doing to then make sure that our investment products can respond dynamically, given that we're constantly getting more information and also more management teams, frankly, are making different decisions? Look, in our own surveys of clients all over the world, what we've seen is a remarkable shift and desire to shift much more towards sustainable investing. So today it's about 18% of clients' portfolios globally. They want to move to 37% over the next five years. It's a little bit more muted in the United States. It's 13% today, moving to 20%. But the trend line and the direction all around the world, in the US, in Asia, in Europe, is very, very clear. And I think that's inherent in this tectonic shift of a reallocation of capital. But in terms of what investors can do, I do think Chris's point is well taken that historically, this has been a little bit binary, right? And we have a series of screened products that meet the needs of clients who either want to screen out certain carbon intensive investments or certain investments that don't meet their values. We also have thematic investings, which can focus on a particular theme like clean energy. But I think the thing in the middle around transition, where institutions like Calster has been at the forefront is really about supporting the transition in the economy. And I don't think there's enough that's talked about in that regard, because how do you enable companies through both positive and negative incentives, through engagement, to really change their model to be less carbon intensive, but still deliver essential things like energy or infrastructure or transport? Because those are still essential goods that people all over the world need. We just need it in a less carbon intensive way. And I think the really important thing that Chris has said is about how do we support that transition? And if we can get more investors all over the world to really think less in binary terms and more in terms of how do we start to make this transition towards net zero while still delivering essential goods all over the world, that's really the challenge. And that's where I think the investment dialogue needs to shift 
so that it's not just a pioneering idea, it's more of a mainstream idea over the next few years. We have coined our phrase activist stewardship because we've been active in corporate governance for over 30 years, but now we're stepping up our game. We're actually taking on companies, even pushing people to propose alternative slates to get corporate boards to wake up and to recognize it is awfully easy to sit back. Change is hard. Nobody likes it. But you know what? When you think about 2020, as rough as that year has been, we are all pretty adapted to working from home generally very quickly and very fast. But those are changes that were almost seamless, low cost, and had positives. Think about dieting. There's a classic painful change. Everybody puts it off. It's tough, but we know you should do it. This is going to be a tough change, changing from a carbon economy, which has fueled this nation for over 120 years to some other energy sources. Is it going to be free and is it going to be seamless? And we're challenging companies to think more progressively and to do that quickly because changing at the end, it's kind of like a diet, doing it a little bit at a time starting now and over the next two decades is what's going to make a difference and help companies be more profitable in that new low carbon, zero carbon future. And Chris, as you're doing that, what are you looking for a management team or company to respond with? So what does good look like in response? Are you looking for a plan? The tenure of a CEO is much shorter than the time horizon of these problems or the actual pace of change. So what exactly do you want today's leaders to be doing? Yeah, no, you hit it on the head. The CEO life is usually five years, seven years at most. We're going to own these companies for 20, 30 years. What we're looking for right now is the language, the risk reporting, disclosures from the companies that are quickly willing to measure their carbon need and their carbon emissions. What gets measured gets managed. Very soon though, by the time you hit 2025, which really is coming up quick, we're gonna wanna see actual changes and number metrics improving and reducing the amount of carbon they rely on. But right now it's gotta be about measurement and intention. And there are a lot of CEOs who are very wide awake and who are talking openly about that transition. There are others who have their head buried in the sand and are refusing or giving lip service. It sticks out. It's very obvious. And we're aggressively engaging the companies that have their heads stuck in the ground and supporting and rallying around the companies that are beginning to make that transition and study and recognize it. And I think that's what CEOs are paying attention to and boards recognizing they need to make an investment for the long term. And again, it's about long term thinking. And that does stick out very quickly in our engagements. So Celine, Chris mentioned metrics, and we don't really have an agreed upon metric for a company's transition risk. We don't have the equivalent of a Morningstar rating or a calorie count. So what innovations have we seen and what are you hoping we will see that you could apply to the business that you lead? This is a really, really exciting time to be in the middle of climate data and data analytics, because now you actually have something to work with. I mean, 10 years ago, it was a lot more intuition and a lot more trying to find things that could work with limited data. There's still a very healthy amount of intuition at work, but there's just a lot more data to work with. And whether that's asset managers like us, asset owners like Calsters, academics, or other providers in the broader ecosystem that have an interest in this, I actually think that we're gonna be evolving rapidly towards standard setting and towards being able to make transparent All of these decisions with that transparency will come even better data and even better incentives to contribute more data, which just makes the numbers and the analysis and the outcomes even better. So we've been talking a lot about how the investment community is leading and bringing some companies along, but policy obviously is a huge factor in the transition and the speed at which we're going to transition. We have a new administration, one that has a pretty different position on clean energy in the United States than the previous one. How do each of you sort of think that that might change the investment community's role or perhaps what kind of changes would you anticipate in the next couple of years that we might have as a result of that different leadership in the U.S.? And Chris, maybe I'll start with you. You know, I think it's fascinating that even with the last administration, companies still kept making steps going forward. They recognized the long-term path irregardless of government regulation. And that's important to realize. But you need government regulation to come alongside. And that's the big change is going from a headwind to now being a tailwind 
and pushing companies to adapt and to change. I think you're going to see an increased effort, certainly in the infrastructure side, that looks like that's coming. But in terms of companies being willing to step out and make long-term capital commitments to changing their energy sources or their waste, because they realize that the future is coming quickly and they have to do something now. I hate to go back to my diet analogy. I can personally relate to that. So for the audience, can understand you know, you put it off for a while, you put it off for four years, well, then it comes charging right back and you've got to pick up the speed even more. So thankfully, corporations generally didn't step off the effort. And I think now we're going to see the government come alongside and increase it even more so that we begin to get some of those transition investments in infrastructure, other things that make it easier. The fact that General Motors announced the end of the internal combustion engine you got to stop and soak that in for a minute. General Motors, the creator of the giant SUV, said they're going to stop using internal combustion engines starting in 2030. And I think we're going to see more companies surround that and support that. So to me, the transition's happening right now. So Salim, Chris mentioned tailwinds. What then do you think is still challenging about obviously the actual changes in technology innovation, but in terms of getting more companies on board, getting more investors on board, what are some of the challenges that you are seeing or anticipate? Yeah, at least look from an investment point of view and from the seat that I'm in and us as a firm, I'm kind of living this dual set of emotions. One is urgency and the other one is patience. There's urgency to act because we need all across the entire industry to have ever more engagement, to have ever more focus on standard setting, to have ever more transparency and ever more customized choices in terms of pathways that investors can implement these changes in their portfolio. And so that's where the urgency comes in and the urgency to act. But at the same time, these are often decade-long transitions. And you need the patience to be able to help companies see this transition through. And often by looking at climate reduction with a two-year lens or a three-year lens, you may achieve that goal, but you may miss out on the bigger and more important transition, which comes in 10 years or in 15 years by supporting new technologies or supporting new infrastructure or supporting changes in cement production or steel production or things that require big shifts in the underlying economy. And that's where the patience comes in. And I think that lends itself to long-term investors like retirement systems that Chris represents, or long-term investors like indexation, right? Because our average holding period for a large U.S. equity is 25 years. And you kind of need that type of mindset, coupled with the urgency to act now, because many of these changes will take many, many years to put into place, to build the infrastructure, to make the investments. Salim, you used a phrase of 25 years. That's going to last through multiple administrations. And so I think that's why the recognition, you need the government behind it, you need the government creating and investing its capital, and not just the U.S. government, but all the nations of the world. You have over 200 countries who signed the Paris Accord. The governments need to make those strides, but it's companies that have to keep up the constant drumbeat because 25 years is a marathon. So it's not the pace per mile, but it's about over time and staying committed and implementing this change in the economy. It's going to be a challenge. Do you think it's fair to say that sustainable investing is mainstream in 2021? It's certainly on a path, but you know, if we were talking innings, I think it's in the second, not in the fifth or sixth, mm-hmm. because I do think this point about urgency is going to need to persist like today, next year, the year after, and the year after that to really make sure that these changes can happen. And I do think Many firms are just going to need to be able to have the processing power for all of this new data Mm -hmm. around the interplay between climate, economies, short-term and long-term risks. And I think that that's going to take some time. So I wouldn't say it's yet mainstream. I think that even ideas like the one that Chris had articulated around supporting the transition and not just being binary around divestment or not, that's a really powerful idea. That is not a mainstream idea. I think making that a mainstream idea will serve investors better, will serve the climate better, and will serve economies, not just in California, but all over the world better if we can do that. 
But I think that's just inherent in the challenge of there's always a new thing that we need to bring into the mainstream to solve this multi-decade problem. Two things you said that are interesting. The first is sustainability mainstream. Really depends on where you're sitting. I would tell you in Sacramento, California, absolutely. But if I think of my friend Sam Masudo in Wyoming, totally different definition. Texas, totally different definition. But then I look globally and I look at the Dutch funds, the European funds. It's actually a fiduciary responsibility. It's totally mainstream. And your question about measuring how are we improving on this transition, a lot of people love the idea of just measuring your carbon footprint, but that's pretty meaningless to a technology company. And so not only is sustainability depend on where you're sitting, but measuring the impact depends on the type of company it is. And some companies, there are much more meaningful measures about their impact to the climate and to the transition. And then there are some companies, I'll pick on electric utilities, where it's right core to the center of what they're doing and how are they impacting it. So again, it's too simple to say this is a big challenge and complex, but it's really complex because it's as varied as the world and as varied as all the industries in the U.S. or the global market. And so on that note, one last question for each of you. I'll start with you, Salim. We have talked about how hard this is, what a long journey it will be. What is your hope for what change you would see that might make the transition either more effective or likely to happen? I just come back to these dual themes of urgency and patience. We need urgency to act now, whether it's around ideas like transition, and we need patience to be able to support companies making that transition, which are often 5, 10, 15-year investments. And being able to keep both of those conflicting ideas in our minds and in our actions is how we get to the type of positive version of the proposition that Chris wants to articulate to a new teacher or a new saver or a new investor for a long-term horizon. And I'm going to jump in and say patience requires a long-term perspective. And that's what we're trying to push is stop thinking about the next six months, stop thinking about the next nine months. I have a 30-year investment horizon. It doesn't do me any good to give a teacher who's starting now, let's say this coming fall, starting teaching, it doesn't do me any good to hand them a retirement check in 35 years or 30 years and have the earth almost unlivable. I'm trying to invest for their future and with their future and provide that retirement benefit, so I need that return, but into a planet that's livable and where they can afford to live. And again, Adapting and changing is very difficult for human beings, but it's going to be absolutely mandatory. Our world is changing and we need to react and get ahead of it. Well, thank you. That's a great note on which to end. And thank you both for the time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Thank you, Celine. I enjoyed it. This material is for informational purposes and is prepared by BlackRock, is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research, or investment advice, and is not a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or to adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of the date of publication and are subject to change. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by BlackRock to be reliable and are not guaranteed as to accuracy or completeness. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. There is no guarantee that any forecast made will come to pass. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the listener. Past performance is not indicative of current or future results. This information provided is neither tax nor legal advice, and investors should consult with their own advisors before making investment decisions. The value of investments and the income from them can go down as well as up, and you may not get back the amount invested. In the U.S. and Canada, this material is intended for public distribution. In the U.K., this is issued by BlackRock Investment Management U.K. Limited, authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, registered office 12 Throgmorton Avenue, London, EC2N, 2DL, telephone plus 44020, 7743 3000. 
registered in England and Wales, number 202-0394. For your protection, telephone calls are usually recorded. BlackRock is a trading name of BlackRock Investment Management UK Limited. In Singapore, this is issued by BlackRock Singapore Limited, co-registration number 2000-10143N. In Hong Kong, this material is issued by BlackRock Asset Management North Asia Limited and has not been reviewed by the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong. In Australia, issued by BlackRock Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 13 006 165-975, AFSL, 230-523, BIMAL. The material provides general information only and does not take into account your individual objectives, financial situation, needs, or circumstances. In Latin America, this material is for educational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice nor an offer or solicitation to sell, or a solicitation of an offer to buy any shares of any fund. No securities regulators in Latin America have confirmed the accuracy of any information contained herein. The provision of investment management and investment advisory services is a regulated activity in Mexico, thus is subject to strict rules. For more information on the investment advisory services offered by BlackRock Mexico, please refer to the Investment Services Guide, available at www.blackrock.com. mx Copyright 2019, BlackRock Inc. All rights reserved. BlackRock is a registered trademark of BlackRock, Inc. All other trademarks are those of their respective owners.